Our text is from Gospel According to John, chapter 6, the first 13 verses. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. And Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, What are we to buy? Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said to the people, sit, Make them sit down. Now there was gra a great deal of grass in that place, and so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several weeks ago, Pastor Vaughn mentioned the Reverend Fred Shaw, who is one of our speakers at annual conference. And one story that he told caught my attention. He was telling about one of his first appointments as a new pastor. Reverend Shaw came to this little rural church, and when he went in, there were three old people huddled around a pot-bellied stove. Well, this is the summertime. And it turned out to be two sisters and their older brother, ages 88, 89, and 90. They were the congregation. Reverend Shaw led the worship service, and as he was leaving, the older brother came out to the parking uh, lot to talk to Reverend Shaw, and he said something to the effect that, well, we're getting older here, and I suppose when we die, the church will die. Well, Reverend Shaw said when he left there, he was angry with the bishop for sending him there and wasting his talents and congregation, the denomination for uh, keeping the little church open. And when he got home, he called his grandfather, who was a retired clergyman, and venting his feelings, he told him about his mourning with only three people there. And his grandfather said, well, you didn't have just three people there. You had a great cloud of witnesses present. For there were all the people who preceded you at that church and all who are yet to come. You are but one link in the chain of faithful people that God has prepared for himself, and you are never alone, for God is with you, and you have a strong gallery of people present when you gather for worship. Well, Fred Shaw said that next Sunday he shared the message that we are a vital link in the chain of witnesses that God is counting on to continue the ministry of his church. We are the link between those who have gone before, mentoring and sharing the faith with us and the people yet to be reached for the Lord. Well, after church, the older brother came out to talk again with Fred, and he said, you know, I don't want to be the last link in the chain here. And in the months ahead, those three old folks went out and brought in 46 new young members. A number of years later, Reverend Shaw received an invitation from the church to come back for a reunion time. He had a conflict with that date, but he called the pastor there and expressed his regrets. But he said, I have a story to tell you. And he shared about the older members bringing in 46 new members. And the pastor said, I'm well aware of that story. I was one of the 46. God is good all the time. God is good. 
That story caused me to think back in my own life to some of the people who had encouraged and mentored me in the faith. How about you? Who did God put in your life to help and encourage you? I hope you still have some encouragers in your life. Have you kept your link in its chain strong and bright? Have you helped encourage others who God is leading to become a part of this chain of witnesses? Who will demonstrate God's great love and mercy? All too often, we face the needs of the church and the great needs of our world with the hunger, poverty, hatred, and conflict, and we back off saying, hey, I'm only one person. What can I do? Well, I'm glad that Reverend Shaw's parishioners didn't say that. Our sermon title for today is taken from a book titled by Dr. J. Harry Haynes, former chief executive of UMCUR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. The book is entitled, I'm Only One Person, What Can I Do? In this book, Dr. Haynes lifts up the lives of a number of persons who responded to that question. Their response was, I and my God together we can do miracles. We can climb impossible mountains. And the biblical inspiration comes from the feeding of the 5,000. There are four separate accounts in the gospel record of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They're very similar as to the essential details of the miracle. However, Matthew 15 has Jesus using seven loaves and a few fish, feeding 4,000. But each of the Gospels have Jesus multiplying the loaves and fish to serve the people. Jesus was on the shore of Lake Galilee, and a large crowd had followed him, and Jesus spent the day teaching and speaking of the kingdom. It was close to Passover time, John says. The day was far spent, and a great crowd was tired and hungry, and our Lord turns to Philip and asks him where food can be bought to feed the people. And Philip realistically informs the master that it can't be done. I mean, they're in a place where there's no food for sale, and if everyone had just a little bit, it would cost about six months' salary. It was just too much. And so there wasn't any place to buy the food. There wasn't any money. And so what could be done? Well, we're all aware of the facts that Jesus took five loaves of barley bread and two fish. But John gives us the real answer to what happened. He tells us that Andrew discovers a small boy with a luncheon packed, supposedly by his mother, who takes this little offering and turns it over to the Lord of life, and a great miracle takes place. That nameless little boy in that wilderness place becomes a part of the miracle. The gospel record is quite clear. It was a partnership involving a little boy's gift and the Lord of life, touching, blessing, multiplying, that met the need of that moment. Today, in the traditional site where Jesus taught, sits the chapel of the Beatitudes, looking out over the Sea of Galilee. And much of the view from there is similar to what it was in Jesus' day. Picture in your mind the lake the tired crowd listening to the teacher from Nazareth who talks about the change that can come into a human life when God takes over. And then the crowd and the discouraged disciples have thrust into their midst a little boy and his loaves and fish and the master. It must have all seemed utterly preposterous, for in the real world, things don't happen that way. But this time, in an astonishing way, it did. Andrew put their doubts into words when he presented the boy and his lunch. He said, well, here's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus accepted the gift, had the people sit down, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed the bread and the fish to those who were seated. When we offer ourselves and what we have to the Lord. He can do great things to meet the needs of his people. Dr. Haynes, in his book, invites the readers to journey with him around the world. And Haynes visits the P 
people, with people and ask them to share their understanding of faith. And in hearing these stories, Haynes wants his readers to move beyond the feeling of feeling so overwhelmed by the world that they cry out, Oh God, I'm only one person. What can I possibly do? Like the little boy in the feeding of the 5,000, there have been others who in God's strength have dared to tackle tough, seemingly impossible jobs. Dr. Haynes shares the stories of several of God's adventurers. It's not in Dr. Haynes' book, but we can turn to our own denominational history to find stories of persons who have partnered with the Lord to perform miracles. Persons like John and Charles Wesley who began preaching outdoors to reach persons who the church wasn't reaching. And there are Francis Asbury, Philip Otterbind, and the early circuit riders who gave their all to reach an ever-moving population on our growing frontier. And today is the birthday of Methodism's founder, John Wesley. You remember the religious authorities asked him to confine his preaching to his parish. What was his answer? The world is my parish. I'm glad when he saw the need to reach the miners and the unchurched people of his day that he didn't say, I'm only one person, what can I do? Our church has a number of persons who have said yes to God's invitation to help the hungry, the needy, and the oppressed. Apart from our local missions, which we have ongoing, we have a team just back from working on church camp in Hawaii, our team of bicyclists are bicycling across Nebraska this next week to raise money to fight hunger. In July, we'll have a medical team and a construction team leaving for Honduras. On the national level, our senior highs will send a group to work on a Navajo reservation. Also just returned are some junior high youth who were working at Heifer Project International's ranch last week. One of the people that Dr. Harry Haynes lifted up in his book as an example of someone who moved beyond the I'm only one person syndrome to active service is Dan West, the founder of Heifer Project. And when the individual turns over his or her life to Jesus Christ and is sensitized to human need like Dan West, then be prepared for miracles. I mean, what can I do? I'm only one person. Well, here is where Dan West and his amazing life can be of great inspiration and help to us. Dan was the first layperson to ever moderate a church of the Brethren Annual Meeting. He was a churchman who early staked his life on the conviction that the church is the only sure leaven in society that can make the kingdom of God real and visible on earth. Almost his entire life, he worked for peace. He helped feed the hungry and clothe the naked. He gave direction and inspiration to young and old, all under the official direction of the denomination into which he was born. He was a pacifist, a peacemaker, a believer in the miracle of the human heart. Dan had the idea for Heifer Project in 1937, when in Spain he saw hungry children but he also saw fields of rich grass. And he thought, what if I could get them some cows to eat that grass and produce milk for those hungry children? Instead of sending powdered milk, Dan wanted to send heifers with fresh milk. And Dan took his idea back to the church, but it took a number of years before the dream became reality. In 1942, the first heifer, a Guernsey named Faith, was sent to Puerto Rico to provide milk for little children. And the underlying principle to Heifer Project is no one could receive a heifer unless they agreed that the first offspring of that animal would be given to a needy neighbor. Volunteer, quote, cowboys travel with the gift to look after both the gift of the animal and the personal contact involved in the delivery of the gift. And this procedure carried out Dan West's concern that gifts should indeed be living gifts. Because of Dan West's dream for feeding hungry people, thousands of people have been helped and exposed to God's love in the flesh. As Dr. Haynes has said, 
Brotherhood takes on meaning because first a Brethren Dreamer, Dan West, and then his Church of the Brethren realized that this kind of service and fellowship knows no boundaries. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was graphically re reenacted when Dan West went into partnership with the Lord of Life. Another feeding miracle Dr. Haynes tells us about is one involving the people of Algeria. It involved a Frenchman, Jean Corbonnier. Jean, who on behalf of the World Council of Churches uh, was recruited to help the people of Algeria rebuild in the 1960s after their bloody war for independence. The need was overwhelming. In Constantine alone, 150,000 people were facing starvation. Their beautiful forests had been burned by the French during the war, attempting to drive out the rebels. Jean Haynes said, has always believed that the greatest gift that one can give to another human being in their hour of need is not, first of all, physical necessities, such as food, clothing, and shelter, but the gift of dignity to help people help themselves. The love and compassion found in Sean's heart caused him to say, I'm only one person, but I can and must do something. Cognier went to, with a plan for Algeria to church and government officials and explained his idea for help. He said, my plan, first of all, is to keep the people alive with emergency food, which must come from the vast quantities of agricultural surplus in America. But in return for food, they're going to plant trees that will replace the burned out forest lands on the edge of the Great Sahara Desert. I will call it food for work, bread for my neighbor. Jean Carbonier's plan recruited people of all ages the older people planted, watered, and cared for the young trees, but the children were enlisted to keep the goats away from the young plants. Without the children's help, the goats would follow the planters and eat the young plants before they had a chance to survive. Then the miracle began. Jean inspired everyone with whom he came into contact. Slowly but surely, the forest was replanted, and before long, the people also began to rebuild their lives, and soon the first million trees were planted. And in that first planting of trees, they had a 70% survival rate, unheard of in that era. And in the end, the people were fed, and 130 million trees were planted and secured. God performed another of his miracles. What can one person do? Well, with God's help, much indeed. Jean later was called upon to help in Senegal. Some years later, he helped them establish an irrigation plan in connection with a nearby river. No one had, on the international level had even recognized the potential of the river, but Jean saw the possibilities for that desert area that others did not. Grow rice in the desert? But Jean knew about how to bring that change about, and the tide of hunger was turned when they grew rice, bananas, many kinds of vegetables, and even citrus trees. Muslim and Christian alike were helped in the villages being assisted, vowed to share food and knowledge with neighboring villages. The help was passed forward. What others called impossible when human beings are given hope is great. Like our father in the faith, Abraham, God calls each of us to journey with him. We are called to trust in his wisdom, to seek his counsel and help, to entrust our lives to him. When we partner with the Lord, change happens. Lives are touched and hope is offered. We learn that we are not just one person alone. We are partners with a mighty God who can empower us to do what needs to be done. Amen. May it be so.